Hello and welcome to episode 92 of Linux Dev Time. I'm Joe. I'm Marmalis. I'm Kevin. And I'm Andy. Good to talk to you all again and welcome back, Andy. Thanks. Amalith, you had a follow up question that relates to the last episode we did. What are some other very specific aspects of maintaining software that you like to automate? And specifically, also, how do you feel about the GitHub stale bot? I have mixed feelings about the stale bot specifically. <laughs> I understand the intention behind it. I'm not a big fan of getting pull requests that do nothing but update dependencies. And I know that there is a whole topic behind whether or not, you know, dependencies should be audited every time you do an update. But it feels like a very low effort pull request. And that's something I don't mind a bot necessarily warning me, hey, you might have outdated dependencies here. So long as I can also silence it and say, yeah, I'll take care of that the next time I want to look at dependencies. But I'm not, I don't feel like that moves the needle at all for a contributor to start contributing to a code base, because that's not really a meaningful change, in, in my opinion. What does Stalebot do? If an issue or pull request has had no activity, like no comments or anything for a period of time, I think by default, it closes the issue. But then you can also configure it to add a stale label. Or I saw it somewhat recently where the Stalebot closed and actually locked the issue. So no one could even comment on the issue. It explicitly said, if this is still an issue, create a whole new one and duplicate wow. the description. And I don't understand that. <laughs> so I was wondering if you guys had any opinions on oh, that approach. I think I was confusing Stalebot with Dependabot or, or sure. whatever the other one is that mm -hmm. checks your dependencies. Which is also worth talking about. Yes. But Stalebot, marking an issue as stale, maybe. But I have issues even on some of my repositories that are from when the repository was first open sourced years ago. So if an issue is not complete, it's, I, I mean, maybe it's stale, but I don't see much use in that, especially locking it. I don't think that that's very useful unless someone decides to re-contribute to an old issue that's been closed and then there's nothing new there. Like, sure, but that's on the moderators and the owners of the repository to do. I don't, I don't really see much value in a, a bot doing that. It feels like a bad solution to a real problem. Uh, the, the Element Web project has hovers around 4,000 open issues. And that is a real problem. But automatically closing them because they're old is not a useful solution, right? What we need is more attention and time put into figuring out whether they're still a problem, whether they're duplicates, whether we're never going to fix them. And those, those are things that only people can do. And please, Lord, preserve us from AI doing it. <laughs> I was going to say, you need to, an, an AI bot that's, you know, a triage bot or whatever. I was literally about to suggest that. <laughs> well, you're lucky you didn't. Or I would have just jumped straight out the window. <laughs> Depend bot, isn't that dealing with the software bill of materials issue? Like, isn't that a really useful, good thing? Shouldn't everybody care about that? I think so. And I'm curious to hear why, why Kevin potentially disagrees. I love the idea of Dependabot. I even run a different tool called Renovate that operates on like a self-hosted forge, specifically for JO. Whenever I have dependencies that are outdated, it'll create a, automatically create a pull request for me and include the new version's release notes in the issue so I can read about what changed and just two clicks, and that dependency is updated. So I don't disagree. It's not that I dislike Dependabot. I dislike the PRs that those bots, or even non-bots, would create to do nothing other than just update dependencies. That's the part that I find less valuable. Keeping a actual software bill of materials or keeping your dependencies up to date, I, I believe that actually is good work and needs to be done. However, I also think that monitoring your dependencies is probably something that we as software engineers should do more of and don't. That's not a blanket statement. I, I know that there are people in industries that really do monitor their dependencies, but I would say the overall trend is to take on more dependencies with less auditing. And I think that's something that we should actually swing the needle back the other direction. I, I would like more auditing to go into dependencies for security purposes. So you'd prefer using something like Socket over Dependabot, for example? I've never used Socket. I have heard about it before, but I would prefer something that 
informs me that a dependency may be out of date, especially if there is a security issue involved with it. However, I would like to be the one to actually decide when that happens and, and how we go about doing that. Because even some of the blanket, hey, there's a security issue in this particular dependency version XYZ is not always super helpful because you may not be hitting that code path or be in an environment where that affects you. In getting the blanket, you must upgrade this dependency because you have a security vulnerability is also not helpful and sometimes can even be detrimental and harmful to the project because it's really hard to message, no, we are not vulnerable to that particular vulnerability for these reasons when people just see the bot that says version XYZ is vulnerable to CVE123. To push back on that, though, you don't always necessarily know all the potential consequences of a security vulnerability. You might think that it's not going to affect your project because of X, Y, and Z, but there might be an ABC that you're not thinking about. Absolutely. To be vulnerable to something, I would say you don't trigger that CVE at all. If you trigger the CVE or the vulnerability, but you just think it's not an issue, that 100%, I would say that that's not good because you might be used in a chain of CVEs to reach some other higher level of privilege. So where it might be irrelevant is like if it just affects a component you don't use or something like that. Absolutely. And something that eventually is compiled out of your binary entirely yeah, yeah. anyways. Right. Like I think Go's VET tool performs static analysis to see whether a CVE's particular code gets called from your code. Oh, right. And that's how it determines whether a CVE effect, whether a particular Go specific CVE affects you or not. If it's particular to one function in one package, GoVet can determine you never call that function, therefore this CVE doesn't affect you, cannot possibly affect you. Interesting. I have not used GoVet in anger before, so I, I couldn't speak to that. I think it's GoVet. It might be one of the different, or maybe it's GoVoln. I don't know. There's <laughs> There are a few of them. So I thought GoVet was a linter, like an aggressive linter. You might be right. There are tools like that in the Rust community as well, but they they go at that problem a little bit differently where they will take a list of your dependencies, your exact dependencies by hash, and then compile that list down into the static binary itself. That's with the purpose of later on when you have a tool or binary that's installed on a system, you could actually look at that actual binary and see which libraries and dependencies came from that binary, and you could then do some sort of checking. Now, where I think that falls over a little bit is that does not do all of the like tree shaking where it will remove all of the libraries if you never called that particular function from your code. It does feel to me quite a lot saner in the Rust world where you, you can cargo update and you get the latest versions of, of stuff based on the requirements you've already put in. I have a sort of love-hate relationship with Dependabot in that I basically think it's doing something really useful, similar to Cargo Update, right? It's getting all the stuff you should update or you can update and making a pull request, which you can then, human, human can review that and decide whether to merge it. The hate comes from the fact that often I'm working on a project where dependencies are completely out of control. I have no idea what any of them are used for and I'm not in a position to review those changes in an effective way, I might say that's a problem with the JavaScript ecosystem, or I might just say it's a problem with that project. I don't think it's Dependabot's fault that it's, it's a nightmare. I found a tool in the Rust ecosystem called a Cargo Audit to be pretty awesome, and I run that mm. in CI. And I like that a lot because you can have a dedicated audit job that looks at your dependencies, and there's an actual security database that it pulls from, and it will show you I mean, the Rust people typically being somewhat concerned with security are pretty good about saying, hey, this is the code path that actually triggers the CVE or unsafe. But that's really good to have in a, in a separate CI job that you can see it fails. Now I know that there's something I need to look at, or you can silence it because you have a particular, you know for certain you're not hitting that code path. But that's one that I've really enjoyed using. Kevin, you were correct. Go vet reports about suspicious constructs like printf statements that are weird, go vulncheck is the tool I was thinking of. And it makes requests to the go vulnerability database. Okay. So very similar to a cargo audit. Yeah. Completely separate tool though, and not built into the go command at all. The automation that has had the best effect on my life is just the code formatter. The first time I heard about it was when Go came out and it was part of the language that it had to be formatted right. I thought, this is genius. Like, it's probably my best thing about Go and everything else is bad. And then the fact that I've got that in Rust and that, these days you even get it in like C++ with LLVM as a formatter. And, and even poor old JavaScript can be forced into some kind of 
automated formatting. So yeah, things got a lot better when that came into my life. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Collide. When you go through airport security, there's one line where the TSA agent checks your ID and another where a machine scans your bag. The same thing happens in enterprise security. But instead of passengers and luggage, it's end users and their devices. These days, most companies are pretty good at the first part of the equation, where they check user identity. But user devices can roll right through authentication without getting inspected at all. In fact, a huge percentage of companies allow unmanaged, untrusted devices to access their data. That means an employee can log in from a laptop that has its firewall turned off and hasn't been updated in six months. Or worse, that laptop might belong to a bad actor using employee credentials. Collide finally solves the device trust problem. Collide ensures that no device can log into your Okta-protected apps unless it passes your security checks. Plus, you can use Collide on devices without MDM, like your Linux fleet, contractor devices, and every BYOD phone and laptop in your company. So support the show and go to collide.com slash linuxdevtime to watch a demo and see how it works. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash Linux dev time. Quick bit of admin then. First of all, thank you everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. If you want to join those people, you can go to linuxdevtime.com slash support. And remember that for various amounts on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed of either just this show or all the shows in the Late Night Linux family. And you also get quite a lot of episodes a day or so early. And if you want to get in contact with us, you can email show at linuxdevtime.com. One of my concerns with CI and CD systems is that it's all got a bit out of hand and it just seems to be every developer's go-to. Like, yeah, we'll just chuck CI, CD at it. And they don't consider necessarily the environmental impact of that and the compute requirements for that. Is there sometimes a limit to how much you should actually do of that and kind of rein it in a bit? Or does it just come down to the fact that people's time is worth way more than the electricity and resources that are required to run those systems. I went a bit wild integrating CI CD with Forgeo for my business about a year or so ago. Everything had CI. It all ran every time I pushed. There was a lot. It was ridiculous. And I've since pulled that back majorly. As an individual, I don't think I need to run CI CD for linting and deploying and tests and all that kind of stuff because I can just do that locally. I can have a git pre-commit hook that runs that stuff before I actually make the git commit to make sure that the code is all up to scratch before it's ever even committed and pushed. But I do think CI systems have a lot of value when you start bringing in external people because maybe they forget to run the linting. Maybe they forget to do the static check and that kind of stuff. Or if it's more of a company repo, maybe you don't want to give that person access to deploy the software. So you integrate CI that does that deployment for them. All they do is commit, push, everything else is handled by some other entity. So I think there's a time and a place and it's probably used a bit more often than it needs to be at the moment. I agree that it's definitely used more often than it needs to be right now. I like to keep those times down just for developer productivity. If you're waiting on an hour long CI every single commit, that's that's an awful experience. So I like to keep or be smart about my CI usage. And if you're not touching these files, don't run these things. I like to be smart about that. I think the environmental concern is also another key factor into how or why we keep those CI CD systems manageable. But I have not thought about a good way to measure the impact that each CI CD system. I know that there are systems out there that can measure like server contribution to like how much electricity a server is using. I wonder if there's a good way to visualize that for a particular like CI CD run. That would be really interesting to see. Um, But I think by keeping developer time productive and keeping those CI times down, you actually also help the environment. And then I would also say uh, just comically, using compiled languages that are efficient, like Rust, uh, also helps keep (laughs) the environmental impact down because it runs much faster. Yeah, I I would absolutely agree that when you've got lots of people together, you can get a massive amount of value from that stuff running in a kind of standardized, completely repeatable environment. But also, it has gone completely insane. And I think what's wrong with the kind of culture at the moment is that a lot of very expensive stuff happens automatically when you didn't even intend it to. You just push a commit or something and it all happens. 
some of that is good for it to run straight away. But a lot of it, like checking that the release builds or whatever, that should be a manual click for me. Like I love the fact that it's automated and repeatable, but why is it happening every single time I move, I do anything? Yeah, I agree that a lot of people, individuals, even companies have gone a little bit too far in one direction and every single commit, everything gets run for the entire mono repo. And then we make a new release on every single commit. I do think that that's incredibly excessive, potentially extremely wasteful energy wise. So I think there's a lot that could be done in this. And part of that's probably education and just showing people how much they're using per CI run. I do think also on the Rust point, I'm a huge fan of Rust and I I buy the argument that you spend the time at compile time because that happens on a lot fewer computers than runtime. But on the other hand, boy, does it take a lot of computing resources to recompile your Rust project from scratch. Maybe we shouldn't be doing it quite so often. I think someone has done some studies on this. I I, I can't point to any directly, so this might just be Kevin making it up. (laughs) But for example, something like the Python linter rough it runs so much faster than, say, PyLint. And the amount of times that the linter for a Python project is run, yeah. I'm pretty certain massively outweighs the amount of time it takes to compile the rough binary. Absolutely. I think I've seen that somewhere. I just can't remember where. And the more popular your project is, the more that equation works out, right? So for big projects, um, investing a lot in a lot of computing resources to compile it is worth it if it's then going to get run a lot. But I do think that this is absolutely something we, sh- we should consider and get some better tooling around visualization. I, I would love to personally see this kind of thing. So for your projects as maintainers and also projects you've been involved with as contributors or users, how do you communicate with people? Does everything happen in GitHub issues or do you take it to an IRC channel or an XMPP mock or, or what? So for mine, it's primarily been GitHub issues and PRs. However, I've also had a Gitter channel for a while. And then when that got shut down, I stood up a Zulip instance and that worked. So some sort of near real-time communication has definitely helped. That has since moved to the actual Rust Zulip. But some sort of near real-time communication is very, very helpful when there's a particular issue you just want to go back and forth about a little bit or get a little bit more context or uh, something along those lines. But I would say it's probably 75 to 80% GitHub issues and PRs or discussions. We talk a lot through issues and pull requests, but obviously as a matrix project, we encourage people to come into our matrix room. We have a matrix room for each sub-project. And uh, I find for questions and answers, I actually find that's not great, but for building a community, it's amazing. And I think that kind of sense that you know that person's name and you know what how they're thinking when they make their GitHub issue and stuff like that, I find it incredibly helpful for that. Actually, technical conversations, there's normally two or three going on at the same time. You can't follow it. And it doesn't, I'm not sure it's the best way. Yeah, for searchability and history, mm. near real-time communications are, are pretty bad when it comes to those technical topics. It's, it's much better to have that in, in the issues or PRs. I actually really like in-person interactions. So video calls, if they have to be, or actually in-person it's great, but with external contributors, that's really, really difficult. I've never tried that. I'm not sure how you would do it, but maybe it's something some people have done. I don't know. I can't say I've ever done a video call or anything like that with an external contributor. I actually posted a poll to the Fediverse a few days ago, maybe a week ago or something, asking people what their opinions on platforms were, because I want to have some sort of near real-time chat option for my Willow project. And I was wondering whether issue tracker, mailing list, XMPP, and IRC covered the major bases. And based on the result of that poll, which has had something like 200 votes now, those options would serve 93% of people. Only 7% of people who responded said that none of those platforms were suitable for them. I would say, in my opinion, probably going down to one option would be best to start with, Mm -hmm. because while you might be able to get a few more percentages by having a bunch of different communications platforms, at least in my experience, having more than one communication platform, more than one near real time, Mm -hmm. it gets to be more stressful for an individual contributor because conversations happen in multiple places and it just gets harder. Absolutely. Yeah. Fewer is better because you need to have enough people there for it to actually work as a as a community so if you got like I, I used to have my projects on SourceForge and they had a mailing list and they had a tracker and all kinds of stuff a wiki and all kinds of things 
And uh, yeah, the more you have, the harder it is for anyone to actually find each other. So fewer is better. Keeping the number of platforms down was part of the intent behind the poll. The mailing list and the ticket tracker are slower, not real time at all. The IRC and XMPP are definitely real time. And I was wondering whether those two would meet most people's needs. And yeah, they, they, they did. Yeah, it feels like one of each, basically. One, one to build community and one to store information. Sure, yep. Well, we'd better wrap it up. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Amalith. I've been Kevin. And I've been Andy. See you later.